Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Today, I would like to share my dreams. My dream is to decipher the neural mechanism consciousness and as a byproduct, implement mind uploading. So mind uploading is something that we only see in movies. It seems like a far off dream, but I would like to convince you that it's not so. I will propose you with a scientific sound method. So the good news is that unlike other methods, you don't, like, you don't need to die and taking your brains out. It would be a totally seamless process. So the second good news is that I'm trying to implement it in the next 20 years, and I believe that we have a good shot at it. So let me try to convince you by this end of the talk. So what is consciousness anyway? So I'll take pain as an example. So if you bump your toes into a chest, pain receptors situated under your skin emit electronic signals. Then an electronic signal travels through the spinal cord and arrives at the brain. From there, neurons take over. So our brain has nearly 100 billion neurons as a complex intertwined neural network. So, but then again, it is nothing more than an electronic circuit. So according to Francis Crick, we are nothing more than a pack of neurons. So the big mystery is, why do we, the pack of neurons, subjectively experience, for example, pain? So this is the big mystery. So this big mystery, the gap between objectivity and subjectivity, how this sensation emerges from physical matter is the big question. So according to Levine, he calls it the explanatory gap. According to Chalmers, he calls it the heart problem. And according to some scientists and philosophers, they think that we will never ever solve the problem. But today, I would like to convince you that this is not so. So for nearly a few thousand years since Greek philosophy, we've been going in circles. We didn't have a good strategy. But today, I will present a new strategy, which is introduction of natural laws. On top of that, I will add my final touch so that finally it lets us cut free and start climbing the spider for a true understanding of consciousness. So what is a natural law? Before, uh, let me explain that um, for sure, the science of consciousness would protrude conventional science. This is because this is the very first time we attempt to decipher what is to be something, the first person perspective, a subject experience. But the interesting point here is that it doesn't necessarily mean that it is fully incompatible with conventional science. The point here is natural laws. So for example, Einstein's special relativity theory sits upon the foundation of constancy of light velocity. So very strange things happen. We may, you may actually question whether this was true but after we find out that this is the rule, there's no point in asking why. This is just how the universe works. So since consciousness science is protruding, it's for sure we need a new natural law. And the moment we admit this, the hard problem and the explanatory gap vanishes into thin haze. So let me try to put an example candidate natural law based on hypothesis by Antti Rebunzo. This is called the virtual reality metaphor of consciousness. So Rebunzo focused on memories. So I'm sorry, dreams, while you sleep. And it's very strange that when we are lying in a bed, a totally separate world emerges. In, in that world, you can actually walk through feel your body, and if you drop a plate, it would accelerate with gravity, and it would shatter if it hits the floor. So we can see that this dreaming ability requires very heavy neural processing. It is almost like your conscious brain is hooked up onto a matrix, as in the Matrix movie. 
So big question that Rebenzo asked was that, did the brain evolve to acquire this virtual reality just for the sake of some entertainment during sleep? And his answer is no. So he suggests that while, even while we are awake, we are using the neural mechanisms of this inner virtual reality. So you're hearing to my voices, you see my slides, you're actually using the mechanism that you use during REM sleep. So let me reiterate. So the natural law attempts to unquestionably link the subjectivity and objectivity. And in terms of subjectivity, there's not much to choose from. It is just a subjective experience that somehow mystery arises in physical matter. So it's all up to what you choose for objectivity. So the natural law for consciousness, the neural hypothesis, would presume that the objective side is a neural algorithm that realizes the inner virtual reality. So then, how can we validate such laws of nature of consciousness? This is the big problem. Since natural law is the very foundation of theory, we cannot use theory to validate it. So we have to ask mother nature, which means we have to conduct experiments. And very straightforward logic is that we should use our brains because we already know for sure that consciousness resides. But the problem is, it's not so simple. For example, my candidate law is that the neural algorithm is generating consciousness. To validate that, we have to really make sure that no other mechanisms are functioning. And this is simply not possible using the biological brain, even with the modern techniques like optogenetics. So this is therefore, I suggest that we need to turn to machine consciousness. So basically speaking, I cast hope for spiking neural network simulated on a digital computer because this is because I want to make this happen before I die. So this is why I say 20 years. And I think this is the only hope that we have to try to manufacture a full neural, neural network at the size of the human brain. So, so how can we test machine consciousness? So it's like, if we don't have a test, it is almost like attempting to develop a flying machine on our airless moon. So if we cannot test our machine, there's no room for trial error, which is critical for analysis by synthesis approach. And what hinders testing of machine consciousness is this imaginary construct, philosophical zombies proposed by, initially by Robert Kirk, and then further developed by David Chalmers. So it is a being that looks just like us, behaves just like us, and if you ask, are you conscious? They would answer, yes, of course. But the point is, they are all dark inside, following the words of Chalmers, so they don't have consciousness. So at least when we are discussing Conscious science, we have to assume that maybe they do exist. So that means we cannot use objectivity to test machine consciousness. It only remains that we have to use our own subjectivity. In other words, we have to connect this device to our own brain and see for ourselves. But then again, there's another problem. So this is actually existing person who actually connected a CCD camera to his primary visual cortex. And he actually experienced vision. But this result doesn't guarantee at all that consciousness actually emerged in this artificial retina. So this is the scissor that you've been waiting for. So it is critical for this approach that we come up with a way to test machine consciousness. And in this test, we have to make sure that once we 
experience sensation through the device, we know for sure that actually consciousness has emerged in the machine. So I use this primary primary construct to come up with this test. So as you may know, our brains have left hemisphere, right hemispheres, and they are actually contralaterally connected. That means, for example, vision, the left side of vision is taken care of by the right hemisphere, and the right side of vision is taken care of by the left hemisphere. And very interestingly, a study by Sperry, which won him a Nobel Prize, uh, if you cut the fibers that connect the, two, connect the two hemispheres, actually two consciousness can reside in a single skull. So basically, it is a primary, primary, primary construct, and also for our intact brain, which do have the connections. According to neurophysiology and neuroanatomy, we know for sure that we also have a primary, primary, primary construct. That means it's not that the other side behaves like a secondary, just providing visual information to the other. So I take advantage of this property. Basically, I construct a machine that mimics a human biological hemisphere. I replace it with my own hemisphere and make sure that the connections reproduce exactly what existed before between the two biological hemispheres. Of course, I don't let the machine cheat. And given these conditions, it is impossible for this machine side to function as secondary, just providing visual information to my biological side. Under these conditions, if we do experience full field vision, which means also including the machine side, we know for sure that actually consciousness has emerged in the machine side. So this is my machine, test for machine consciousness. But you might think, well, okay, but if you don't have the means to connect, it's all like a dream. It's just like a, yet another thought experiment. So this is actually my secret device, which I kind of withheld for my Japanese version of my book. But I will have an um, English version of No No Ishiki Kai no Shiki coming out pretty soon by Streaming Nature. And I actually expose this system. So the idea is to dissect neurofibers that connect the two hemispheres, namely the corpus callosum, anterior commissure, and the posterior commissure, and insert a two-dimensional CMOS array of electrodes. So we already have devices that have pitches below like two, three micrometers. And very interestingly, if you look at the postmortem human brain, we know that the axon diameters at the corpus callosum is around 10 micrometers. That means if we manage to rescue the axons with a biological target, we may read and write to all of the axonal fibers that are required to link the two streams of consciousness. So I hope you're convinced. So what would be the final step? Now we have perfected machine consciousness. We have means to connect it to our biological hemisphere. What is the final step that we need to upload our human conscious mind? Let's step back and ask, why do we think we are us when we wake up in the morning? Actually, during non-REM sleep, our consciousness completely is shut down and it's rebooted in the morning. So strictly speaking, I of today is not the I of yesterday. It's I is like the, uh, I think therefore I am like as in Descartes. So the point here is that we actually retain memories. So when I wake up, I can remember what I ate for dinner last night. I can still remember all my childhood events. I can skip, still speak Japanese, maybe not so good English. I can ride a bicycle. And therefore, 
we can be sure that we are ourselves again. So if we manage in the machine to retain the biological memories, we can actually wake up in the machine and say, yes, I have been uploaded successfully. And in terms of memory sharing, it is not that all this difficult because you already have a construct where consciousness is already integrated between the machine hemisphere and the biological hemisphere. So we might need to actively recall and all the neural representations would be mimicked on the machine side. Then we can borrow the brain's mechanism to retain and consolidate memory. So I hope you are convinced. Thank you for your patience. I hope to see you all in the machine. Thank you very much.